Hi everyone, I hope you're all doing okay. So I'm here today to talk to you about the threat landscape. Um, I did used to have a proper job as that's true. Controlling my inner geek though and being able to let it out in controlled bursts like this means I can stand on the stage, sort of on heels above the lectern. Um, for the next 30 minutes we're going to take you through the roller coaster ride of what the bad guys are doing, why they're doing it, why they're after you, things you can do to stop them. Um, if that all goes swimmingly well there might even be a live demo. I might pick on somebody, so if you want to volunteer, that would be great, because otherwise I will just randomly pick on somebody. Um, but here we go. So everybody comes and they all tell you about the threats out there, and they all go, oh, there's loads of threats, but how much of a threat is out there? What's out there? That's what's out there. 82 and a half million unique samples of malware are out there in the wild, okay? That slide there is a couple of weeks old. It is already out of date. Our labs are seeing between a quarter of a million and 300,000 unique samples of malware in any 24-hour period on average. So that number has already grown. Okay? You can see there's a huge exponential growth, sort of 2008, 2009 onwards, and I'll go into the reasons for why that is and what, what is driving that. Now, traditionally... Spam has been the vehicle for malware distribution. You've all had those emails from your long-lost cousins in Africa claiming that if you give them every bit of information about you, they will, and they promise, deposit a billion dollars in your bank account. I don't know why it's always in dollars, but hey, they're just trying to get your information, okay? And a lot of the things, what they'll do now is you'll still get spam. It's, it's, it's on the down, Less people are using it, but you're still going to get it. And it's going to be combined with web attacks, which we'll talk about in a moment. What will tend to happen is you'll get a spam email, you'll click on a link, that'll take you to a web page, a compromise will then be, be done on your machine. The real driver for malware and malware delivery these days is the web. Okay? And the reason for the shift is, is, one, is one thing, really, basically. They have your attention already on the web. Okay? If I sent a spam email out, there's a very low chance you're going you're gonna to click on it because everybody's very well educated against spam these days. You're not going to click on it. You didn't ask for it. It was unsolicited. Why would I click on it? When I browse the web, that's a totally different ballgame. Even if I'm bored at work for 10 minutes and I just log on and I browse the web, I'm there, I'm looking, I'm actively searching for something, okay? That's it. It's content delivery. There's several techniques that the bad guys are going to use here to try and compromise your traffic and get your attention without you knowing it. The key one, and what we're seeing loads of growth of at the minute, is compromising a legitimate website. Okay? Now, this, this is not a scale thing. They're not just going after the huge, huge companies. You know, people like Cisco, anybody that size, they're not going after those guys. Obviously, those guys are really well secured, and it's not going to happen to those guys. But it's not, size isn't a thing that these guys are looking for they will quite happily attack a 10-person 10, 10 company, quite easily do that and compromise their website and look to sniff and get that traffic. Okay? Now, the really important thing to note here is it's your website. You own it. You've got customers going to it. You are now trying to give those customers malware free of charge. Okay? The other way that this is going to happen is they're going to poison advert servers an ad servers. There's several servers on the web and their sole purpose in life is to serve up ads to different websites. If a bad guy can compromise one of those, they can hit millions and millions of, of web browsers really easily, really quickly. The other one is fake websites, but that's dying off because it's much easier for me as a bad guy to compromise your website than it is to create my own. It's a lot of hassle to do that. What does a compromised website look like? Okay, so this is a, a legitimate website that was compromised a while ago. If you browse directly to it, you see that image on the, over there on the far left-hand side. That's what it looks like. It's a perfectly normal web page. Okay, if you went to it via a search engine link, this is what you see here. Okay, now all that sort of rubbish and gibberish at the top is obfuscated JavaScript, and what that is doing is that's telling your internet browser in the background to go to a different web page without you knowing, and at that point, I will fire loads of exploits at your browser, not in an intelligent manner, just literally one after another, until I find a flaw in the software on your computer. At that point, then, I can download my malicious payload and take advantage of your machine and do to it whatever I want to do. Okay, this is how that's happening. Now, 
If I want to, I can also help to try and get up the search list rankings, because whether it's a legitimate website I've compromised or whether it's one I've created, I need to get on those first three pages of a Google search, because let's face it, nobody goes past page three of a Google search, because you've either found what you're looking for, you've got bored, or something else has happened. So what do they do? They let you know what's trending. Okay, so you can load that website with keywords about what people are actively searching for with the intent purpose of getting higher up on that list. So when I did this, Kate Middleton nude photos was the thing that was trending at the time. So if I compromised a website or wanted to put my own, I would load it full of keywords about Kate Middleton nude and photos in the effort to try and get you to click on that because that was the hottest search term of that hour. But it's not just about text links, okay? Text links, you can sort of hover your mouse over and you can go, oh, that looks a bit dodgy. I'm going to there and there and there and then I'm finally ending up on the site I think I'm ending up on. You can see that. Images, totally different ball game. You do an image search, you find a load of images, you click on the one you want, it loads it in the background, it puts the little picture up for you, great, brilliant. The ones highlighted in red take you to malicious websites, okay? So there's pictures there of Kate Middleton, there's pictures there of kittens. We had kittens not so long ago, so we were Googling for kittens and what colour of kitten we wanted. That was my favourite picture of a kitten, and unfortunately it tried to download some malware to my machine. Little bit disappointing. But it's really mundane stuff as well we'll do this. If you search for burger alarm wiring, a lot of images you will see will link you back to malicious websites. So you've got to be aware of what it is that you're browsing and have a little bit of, little bit of nouse in place, really. This is what the shift change has been in that exponential growth of malware. It is now professional, it is organised. The bad guys are running themselves like you would run your legitimate business. Okay? They have the same structures in place, the same goals, the same CRM systems to a certain degree. This is what's driving this malware growth. Okay? It's all professional, it's all organised. The other key thing to note around this, I can do this as software as a service, effectively. Up until now, nobody has taken advantage of the cloud and all the technologies and great benefits you can get from that, as well as the bad guys. Okay? The bad guys are doing the cloud best at the moment. This is a black hole exploit kit. Okay? This is one of the most prevalent out there and one that the attacks are all linked to. I can hire this for $50 a day. I don't need to set anything up. I don't need to do anything. I just need to pay somebody with my stolen credit card the $50, and bang, there I go. Okay? I don't even need to be technical to set this up and do it. It's literally a case of next, 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 finish. That's it. Anybody can do this now. It's on the web. There's wizards. If you pay a little bit more, you can get 24-7, 365 technical support. There's even YouTube channels on how to set and configure all of this up. The sort of information that you're seeing pulled back into here is, is around the machines that you've compromised, what the exploits that you're using have been most successful, so where people have got unpatched Java in this case, that's most successful exploits. If I want the newer exploits, I just pay a little bit more. Okay? Now, what some of the bad guys have done is they've used all of this information. They've gone, great, I've got all of this information, like any business would do. What can I do with it? Okay? They've actually hired call centers out and rang up businesses that they've infected and offered them technical support for their malware. Okay? Businesses have signed up for it. They've been tricked into it. Social engineering on a great scale. Okay? But why are they going to all this data? What do they want? They want your data. That's what they want. Any little bit of data you have about you, your business, your personal data, whether that's on Facebook, whether it's on your company website, your bank account number, your national insurance number, everything has a monetary value to somebody somewhere. And typically what you'll see is the guys that steal your data aren't the ones who exploit it. They sell it on to other gangs who then exploit it. Okay? But it's your data that everybody is after. And that's the thing to remember here. Now, there's been several different families of malware and different types of malware. And you've all heard about scareware. It's quite prevalent, prevalent for the past couple of years. Okay? Basically, you get infected. It says your machine's infected. It's actually malware itself. It's annoying. It tries to steal your credit card details. It asks you to put them into pay to clean up all the malware. Okay? You've all seen this, and that's it. Now, this has evolved into two things, both of which I find really sinister, and I don't like where this is going. The first one is this, and this scares me for businesses, okay? Ransomware. So what they're doing now is rather than try and pop up fake AV, they encrypt the data on your machine. All of your business documents, your business files, anything in your My Documents directory, anything that you might have on a network share that you've got access to, 
they encrypt it with their own encryption key, okay? They then pop up a nice little message that says, ha-ha, I've stolen your data, and if you want it back, you have to pay me. That's all your data. You're held to ransom now as a business. You can't do anything with it. You have three choices here. One, you delete the lot and you restore it from a backup. Painful process. How good's your backup? Two, you get in touch with the guys and you pay them. Okay? Now, some people have paid them, and as you would expect, they've ran off with your money. A few of the guys, though, seem to have a conscience, and they do actually unlock, the, unlock your data. The third is a really, really long shot. Okay, this is, this is your, I'm scrabbling around to get this back. There are tools out there on the internet that will attempt to decrypt them. There is a 99.9% .9 chance that they will not work. Okay, that's the odds that you're playing against with this. So if you get infected with this, you are in big, big trouble. The other split that's sort of come from, um, from Scareware is this. Um, now, this, I, I love this. This is great. The social engineering behind this is just phenomenal. So what this is saying here is, I've been a very naughty boy, and I've browsed an area of the internet that I shouldn't have done. Oh, the shame. Oh, my God. Everybody's going to find out that I've been on that website. But it's OK. It's fine, because the West Yorkshire Police, in association with the chief police officers, have said, it's OK, Andy. If you just pay us a £100 fine, It'll all go away and nobody will know. Brilliant, excellent. How many people in the room do you think is going to be scared into shame and paying that? Nobody's going to go to their IT or, or anybody else and go, oh, what's this? They're just going to pay it. Now, the great thing I like about this particular variant is if you don't like sending credit card numbers over the internet, which let's face it, some of us don't, you can walk into any news agent with a pay point sign and hand over hard cash and it will still get to them. How awesome is that? You know, they've got you both ways. But this is where this is going, and it's social engineering. It's trying to force you to give them money, effectively, through shame, this one. Now, the other big movement that we're seeing through 2012 and tw into 2013 is Android, OK? What's going on with Android? Well, we're expecting massive platform expansion of Android, OK? So traditionally, Android has been on smartphones and tablets. We started to see it come out on some cameras now as well. What you're going to see through 2013 and 2014 is you are going to see Android everywhere. You're going to see it on washing machines, on toasters. Basically, it could become the operating system of white goods, effectively. And the reason for this, one, it looks really shiny and great. If you're in a shop, why would I choose the ones with dials when I can have the shiny touchscreen one? Okay? Secondly, for manufacturing costs, it's actually becoming about the same cost to do this as to put mechanical buttons on. Okay, which one are you going to choose in the store? You're going to go with that one. Personally, I'm looking forward to the first zombie botnet of washing machines. I can't wait for that to hit the press. That's going to be awesome. Um, right, so let's have a go, a little bit of a live demo here, if this works. I'll get the iPad. Have we got any volunteers? Is anybody brave enough to volunteer? You just have to sit where you are and press a button on here. Any volunteers? No? Are you sure? Okay, I'm going to pick on somebody. Just making sure that this is going to work first because, uh, oh, yeah, we're all good. Right. Yeah, I'm not going to fall down the stairs. That would be, that would be, nobody would notice. Right, where am I going? I'm going to go to this gentleman just here. <laughs> um, don't take this question the wrong way. No, it's fine. Can you work one of these? Unfortunately. Excellent, fantastic. I re asked that because I did this a few weeks ago and I asked the nice young lady if she could work this and she said yes and then she couldn't, and it kind of ruined the whole demo. It all went a little bit downhill from there. So if I can ask you to take a picture of somebody photogenic or anything that you'd like to take a picture of, we'll, we'll, we'll play a little technological magic trick. I'm still here, I promise. Okay, so what I'm doing down here is I'm just configuring my machine here because that iPad that you're using has been jailbroken. Okay, so what that means is I've bypassed all the security settings on that. Now you might do that so you could don't have to use the App Store. You're not tied into that. Essentially, if you jailbreak an iOS device, you've essentially stopped Steve Jobs from protecting you. Okay, that's what he does now. He protects you from the cloud. Um, it's a slow burn that one. It's great. Fantastic. Okay, so let me drag this over onto the screen. So this here 
is a Windows box. Now, what a lot of techies do at this point is they bring up this Linux box and it's got all sorts of weird command line things and it's all green and yellow and it looks awesome. It looks like I'm controlling the matrix. I could do it like that. I'm a little bit of a lazy techie. So if there's a GUI, all over it. This is Windows. That's a GUI. I'm connected to that device now. Wherever it goes, whatever it does, I'm connected to it. And I can see all sorts of stuff on it. Now, this is a little bit of a far-fetched example, but hopefully that picture just there. Hold on, I've got to come back across here because I can't see where I'm going. Oh, brilliant. That's a beautiful picture. There we go. Was that your picture, sir? Excellent. There we go. It's a little bit of a far-fetched example, but it just goes to show you what control I now have over that device. I can access all of your phone calls, all of your text messages, all of your applications, all of your personal pictures, anything you have on that device, I now have access to. Okay? I can filter all your email, I can get passwords, I can do everything. That's the level of control I have over this. So these are one of the things that when you do bring your own device, you've got to think about who's got access to what and what you're doing. Okay? Where am I going? Press play. There we go. Excellent. So, the risk is around data loss with these devices, okay? There is malware out there on the Android devices, and that is a risk, and you need to take precautions against that. But at the moment, the biggest risk that you're going to face to mobile devices is data loss, okay? Connecting to fake wireless hotspots, okay? Look at the, the hotspot when you're going to Starbucks. Make sure it's called Starbucks Wi-Fi. This is terrible in airports. You can go to any airport lounge and there are loads and loads and loads of people sat there with a laptop, innocently working away. Actually, they're broadcasting a fake wireless hotspot. Now, all of these mobile devices you've got in your pocket are all sat there going, are you my BT home hub? Okay? Even though you're not asking them to, they're constantly trying to look for a Wi-Fi connection. Now, if I was a little bit unscrupulous, I could turn around to that device on my laptop and go, yes, I'm your BT home hub. Thanks for your password, I don't care what that is. I'm filtering your internet traffic now as well because you've connected to that. So you need to be aware about what you're connecting to and have a little bit of tech savvy stuff. Also think from a personal level, if you're connected to a wireless hotspot that you don't really know, why would you surf banking information? Why would you do things like that? Have a little bit more of an awareness, okay? The other great story with this is I know some people who live in London and they live a mile away from the pub and they go, this is brilliant. My Wi-Fi is so amazing, this home of three rocks the world. I can connect to my home internet from the pub a mile away. You're not connecting to your home internet. You're connecting to a fake wireless hotspot. Okay? So be aware, it's out there. Everybody's doing this. The other thing is around jailbreaking and routing, which is the Android equ equivalent. If you're going to do bring your own device, just don't allow those devices on the network because they're a huge security risk. You can see what we can do to those devices. People are still not setting passcodes on these devices either. It's really important to have a passcode for your own personal sanity as more as anything else. If I leave my phone on the desk, which I have done over there, and no passcode, people can ring up anybody on there. They can see all my email. They can see everything. Set a passcode, okay? Apps and games. Think about what games and apps you're putting on Android devices, okay? The free ones will often say, if you're going to install me, I want access to all of these things. Think about what access and data you're giving away to those developers. Some of the games that you can install on these devices actually request access to even your contact list. Why do they need that for a game that shoots water into a crocodile's mouth? But what's the future holding? Okay, So the next thing that's going to drive this is near-field communication. So that's where you can take your phone and you can swipe it and you can pay for your cost of coffee. How awesome is that going to be? That's also going to make it far more appealing to the bad guys because there's something more serious for them to go after. They can actually steal your cash now fairly easily. The next thing on from that is the digital wallet. So not only can I pay for stuff, it's also got all of my ID in there, my flight details, everything. It's all stored digitally on my one awesome device unless the battery's flat or I lose it. Okay? That's going to make it more awesome. Now, you've all heard about Google Glasses. That's augmented reality. I'm really, really looking forward to Google Glasses. I can't wait to view Street View down the street I'm walking down. That's going to be epic. I'm a little bit unsure about crossing the road, though. I don't know whether the feed's that great. Um, but what can you do? OK, so there's a few things that you can do. But the one that will save most companies and people in here is to do the basics. You need to do the basics. So what do I mean by that? 
Enforce the right policies. Educate your users, okay? Make sure that they know why a passcode is important. Make sure they know why they should prompt their phone to ask them to connect to Wi-Fi. Explain what the risks are, okay? Everybody's there. Everybody needs to do this. The other one, which I know is as dull as ditch water and everybody hates doing it, is patching. But make sure your systems are up to date and patched because if they are, there's far less areas for people like the bad guys to get in on your machine or on your device. If you've got sensitive data on these devices or you just want stuff on there to keep private, look at encryption, okay? Look at it for when it's sitting there on your machine and when you're copying it to USB drives or somewhere else. Encrypt the data, okay? And also at that point, look at who can access what, okay? Even if you're a small business, do you want your temp Saturday checkout staff to be able to log onto the network and see payroll, finance, acquisition information, anything like that? Is that what you want? Think about this. The other really key thing here is layered protection, okay? So desktop anti-malware, antivirus isn't enough on its own, okay, for most businesses. You need to start to build up those layers of protection. Not only for, to stop the bad guys getting in, but if you're, you're unfortunate enough to allow the bad guys in, to stop them getting your data out. It makes it far more difficult if you have to jump through multiple hoops to get stuff in and out. The other really key thing, and what people don't realize, is to protect your online assets, okay? Make sure your website is secure. If you get hacked by one of these guys and they start spilling malware out and you're a big company, you'll probably survive. You'll get a bit of shame in the press, but you'll survive. If you're a small company, think about this. If your website gets hacked, you get in the press, you get named, you get shamed, nobody comes to your website for a month. How is that going to affect your bottom line? What is going to happen to your company? Okay? Are you going to be able to survive that sort of impact? That's what you need to think about. Also think about your social media presence as well. Who's got access to that? What you're posting on there? Password security for that. Don't do what most people seem to do and say, this is my Andy at Yahoo email address and I've got my password. My password happens to be the same to log into Facebook as into Yahoo. Because if I compromise on one site, I've got you across the board now. I'm just going to go, OK, let's try and see if I can log into Facebook with that combination. The risk is there for individuals and businesses. So think about these things. Think about what you can do. With regards to bring your own device, personally, there are three Ps you need to take into account. People, policy, and product. If you get one of those three things wrong, your BYOD will not be as successful as it could be. Okay? Think about these sorts of things. Any questions? I'm around all day. Um, website, Naked Security Blog is great. There's my Twitter feed, which I'm going to start tweeting stuff about. Um, but there we go. That's me all done. So thank you very much for your time. <laughs>